Hello everybody, I am John Allen, your host here on Last Week in the Church. Now, if you watch the show on a regular basis, you know that last week we did a kind of movie motif. This week we're going to do pop songs. We begin with Back in the Saddle, which of course is not really a tribute to the Aerosmith classic, but rather the fact that Pope Francis left the Gemelli Hospital after nine days and is now firmly back in charge, running the Vatican and the Catholic Church. We will bring you the latest and greatest on the papal health front. Second, we have Homeward Bound. German Archbishop Georg Gainswein is now the most famous unemployed prelate in the Catholic Church, having been dispatched back to his home diocese by the Pope with no new gig. We'll try to make sense of what's going on there. Third, don't do me like that. A center in Rome, sponsored by Jesuit Father Marco Rupnik, who has been accused of multiple forms of sexual abuse and misconduct, has struck back against the Jesuit order, accusing the Jesuits of engaging in a media smear campaign and a form of public lynching. We'll try to sort of unpack what's going on there. Fourth. What we've got is Happy Anniversary Baby, a reference to, you know, the, the classic little rhythm band number, only in this case, not really a happy anniversary, but more of a sad one. The 40th anniversary of the disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi, the, the famous Vatican girl, which is coming up this Thursday, will explain why the Vatican is facing increasing calls to disclose what it knew and when it knew it. And finally, we've got Carry On My Wayward Son, which, by the way, is by the band Kansas. I knew those guys in western Kansas where I grew up. I was a personal friend of the guy who was the lead guitarist. But in this case, it's not Carry, C-A-R-R-Y, but Carry, K-E-R-R-Y, former U.S. Secretary of State and Democratic presidential candidate, current presidential envoy on climate, John Kerry, was in Rome this week. We'll bring you the latest in terms of what he talked about with Pope Francis. All that and more is waiting for you on this episode of Last Week in the Church, so please stick around. All right, we begin this week in our tribute to pop music, and, you know, let me just confess, this is the pop music of my generation, right? So we're talking, like, 30 or 40 years ago, but nevertheless, stuff that is still cool. We begin this week with Back on the Saddle, an Aerosmith classic, but we're really talking about Pope Francis, who on June 7th went into Rome's Gemelli Hospital to undergo an operation on his abdomen. It was to repair a hernia that had opened up on the site of a previously undisclosed operation in 1980. And the idea was that this hernia involved his bowel protruding into the abdomen. And so to prevent that, they had to install a kind of plastic net, a mesh, to basically repair the abdominal wall. And that surgery, by all accounts, according to the doctor, the surgeon who performed the procedure, Dr. Sergio Alfieri, went very well. They have counseled the Pope to try to avoid physical activity as much as possible. Now, you know, bear in mind, we're talking about Pope Francis, the energizer bunny of popes, who, for whom physical activity is pretty much as natural as, oh, I don't know, breathing or, you know, drinking or whatever. But in any event, they have tried to convince him to limit the amount of time he is spending engaged in stretching himself so that this new plastic mesh that has been installed in his abdomen so that the wounds don't reopen. Let me just say, as somebody who underwent a surgery on my esophagus back in October, I get it because one of the things the doctors told me then was their main concern was they didn't want the sutures that had, they had put into my esophagus to reopen. If they did, they were going to have to go back in and operate on me again. And I didn't want that. They didn't want it. 
and I think it's probably the same thing with the Pope right now. That's it. Pope Francis has returned to the Vatican on this past Sunday. He delivered his traditional noontime Angelus address. You know, we watched it. You know, what I would say is that he seemed in very good form. You know, he delivered a classic Francis appeal for increased protection of migrants and refugees. This was in the wake of the capsizing of a boat in the Mediterranean Sea that most accounts say resulted in the deaths of about 500 people who were trying to make that crossing across the Mediterranean. He also prayed for the victims of an attack on a school in Uganda, prayed for the martyred people of Uganda. I mean, in other words, it was a vintage Francis performance. By all accounts, Francis wanted to have this surgery now so that he can make all of his appointments for later this summer. He is scheduled to go to Portugal for World Youth Day in early August. Later in the month of August, he is scheduled to go to Mongolia. And then in September, he is scheduled to go to Marseille in France. And all indications are he intends to make those appointments. Let me just tell you, here's what's going to happen going forward. Okay. We have now had a pope who has gone through two hospitalizations in the last three months, who we now know has had four different surgeries, who is 86 years old. Look, fundamentally, two things are going to be true. On the one hand, fans of Pope Francis, his supporters, his base, are going to try to tell you in every way they possibly can that despite whatever problems Francis may be facing, he nevertheless remains strong and resolute, and that he's going to continue governing for the indefinable, you know, indefinite future. Critics of Pope Francis are going to tell you he's been weakened and hobbled, and that we have entered the end game, and that it is time to start speculating about what will come next. Now, the thing of it is, you got to discount both of these takes, okay? Like, here's the thing, okay? The Pope is not going to be as strong as his biggest supporters want you to believe, and he's not going to be as weak as his biggest critics want you to believe. He's going to be an 86-year-old man who has gone through multiple medical procedures, but who nevertheless, right now, looks good to go for the foreseeable future. And that's the truth, you know? So my counsel would be, don't start acting as if the Francis papacy is over, but neither should you start acting as if it will be eternal. Neither one of those things is true. I think, you know, Francis, for the foreseeable future, is going to continue very definitely being the guy in charge. What happens after that? Nobody knows. All right. Second up this week, Homeward Bound a tribute to that Simon and Garfunkel classic, but in this case, also a reference to the fact that the Vatican announced this past week that German Archbishop Georg Gainswein has been, well, what is the word here? Invited, asked, enticed, told, ordered, instructed, demanded, whatever, but in any event, Gainswein is going to be returning to his home diocese in Germany, that's the Diocese of Freiburg, and he has not been given any new assignment by Pope Francis, so it's a little bit unclear what exactly he's going to be doing there other than being a private citizen. Now, look, okay, here's the thing. Archbishop Gainswein was, of course, the priest secretary to Pope Benedict XVI, and as we all know, there was a perception of a tension between Pope Francis, a liberal, and Pope Benedict, a conservative. Now, I don't want to get into how real that tension actually was. That's a conversation for another day. I think what we can all agree upon is that in any event, there was a tension between self-proclaimed followers of Pope Francis, that is the liberal wing of the Catholic Church, and self-proclaimed followers of Pope Benedict that is the conservative wing of the Catholic Church, right? And here's the thing. Because Pope Benedict is no longer around, Gainswine has become de facto 
the new point of reference for that conservative opposition to the sitting pope. Now, if we want to go all Machiavellian about this, right? I mean, the question would be, how does Pope Francis want to deal with his critic, with his opponents? Now, you know, one option would be to basically make it clear that if you are going to cross me, you don't really have a future in this church. I mean, you know, this past week, while Silvio Berlusconi, former prime minister of Italy, famous guy here, while he died, there was a famous Italian journalist, Massimo Franco, who was on TV talking about, about Berlusconi, but he also got a question about Francis and Gainswine. And his answer was, look, this is Francis's way of saying, my knee may hurt, I may have had an operation on my colon, I may have had an operation on my abdomen, but don't fool yourself, I'm still in charge. Okay? And, you know, there's legitimacy to that, right? I mean, it is perfectly legitimate for the commander-in-chief to make it clear that anyone who crosses him, anyone who defies his agenda, is going to pay a price. And that is one legitimate option. Now, another option is, of course, you know, the Godfather philosophy, right? I mean, the famous line from Godfather 2, going to keep my enemies close. No, I'm sorry. I'm missing this up. I'm going to keep my friends close, but my enemies closer, right? And from that point of view, you know, you could argue the smarter thing for Francis to have done would have been to give Gainswine some gig here in Rome, you know, maybe as the archpriest of some papal basilica, maybe as an adjunct secretary of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, where he worked for many years under Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict. Or, you know, some other thing, right? Because a pope can always come up with some gig for somebody if he really wants to. And the idea would have been that if he were still on Francis's payroll, then he would have been obliged to, well, basically keep his mouth shut, right? You know, the difficulty now is that as a private citizen, he can say whatever he wants. You know, I don't know. I mean, time will tell how this plays out. In the meantime, let me just say that being in Freiburg, the most likely thing is that Gainswine is going to end up as some kind of adjunct or associate professor at the University of Freiburg. And let me point out that Freiburg is one of the most prestigious universities in Europe. I mean, Husserl and Heidegger at different points both taught there. So he's going to be in good intellectual company. And he's also going to maintain his position as a leading figure in the, you know, the Ratzinger Foundation. So it's not as if, you know, he's going to drift off into obscurity. You know, we will see how all this plays out. But it is an interesting window, right, into the psychology of Pope Francis. When he is faced with someone he perceives as an enemy, what does he do? Does he try to keep them close? Or does he try to send them away? Well, in this case, clearly, he decided to send them away. All right, don't do me like that, is our third story this week. So basically, this has to do with the story of Jesuit father Marco Rupnik, who is a famous artist. He has created murals and frescoes and tapestries and so forth that adorn, adorn churches all over the world. He's a Slovenian. He was particularly known for his interest in Eastern Christianity and the way he can bring Eastern motifs into depicting classic Catholic themes. I like to think of Rupnik as the second most famous Slovenian in Rome after my wife, Elise, who, okay, I admit she's actually American, but her ancestry is Slovenian. In any way, however you want to parse this, she is by far the least controversial Slovenian Catholic in Rome, because basically everyone would say she's a cool chick. You know, Rupnik, on the other hand, has been in hot water for some time. Anyway, up to this point, neither Rupnik nor any of his allies have said anything about the charges of sexual misconduct and abuse that have been levied against him 
mostly they come from a community of nuns for which he was sort of the ecclesiastical sponsor and chaplain in Slovenia. But what happened this week was that the Jesuit order announced that Rubnik had been expelled. And so in response, the Centro Aleti, the Aleti Center here in Rome, which is the center founded by Rubnik, which is dedicated to kind of the art and spirituality of Eastern Christianity, issued a statement in response to that, basically saying that, well, first of all, the Jesuits were being disingenuous because Rupnik had actually asked back in January to leave the Jesuits. So this idea that they had to kick him out, according to the statement from the center, was I don't want to say a lie, but at least a misrepresentation because they would say he wanted out well before any of this happened. Secondly, they said that the Jesuit order has been engaged in a media campaign, a media smear campaign against both Rupnik and the center. They said that the Jesuits have information in their possession that contradicts the accusations that have been made against Rupnik, but that they haven't disclosed it. And they accused the Jesuits of engaging in, well, what they use the word lynching, kind of high, you know, to, to quote Justice Clarence Thomas of the U.S. Supreme Court, a kind of high-tech lynching, okay? Now, you know, it, it's very difficult to know what to make of all of this. The center the Aleti Center also said that the other Jesuits who are part of the center, and by our count, there are at least four, maybe more, but at least four. Those four have also applied to leave the Jesuit order and to move on to other pastures. One of the things that is not clear about this is that the Code of Canon Law of the Catholic Church says that if a religious applies under canon law for permission to leave, his or her order, well, his because it's a priest, right? They have to indicate which bishop is going to incarnate them, that is, give them permission to continue functioning as a priest. We don't know if there was a bishop who had agreed to receive Rupnik and these other Jesuits, and if so, who they were. You know, that is unclear. What we do know is this that for the very first time since the Rupnik drama emerged last December, when these charges first became public, we now have a response from people loyal to Rupnik basically claiming that the charges against him aren't true and that there is a kind of, well, whatever, a kind of PR exercise going on with the Jesuit order intended to defame Rubnik. You know, we'll see what all this, where all this goes. One footnote is that the president of the Centro Aleti, that is the Aleti Center in Rome, is a consecrated Italian laywoman by the name of Maria Campanetti from Tuscany, who, by the way, was appointed in late 2021 as a member of the Spirituality Commission for the Pope's upcoming Synod on Synodality. She continues to hold that position. You know, we will see as this unfolds whether that continues to be the case or whether there are other repercussions. In any event, my advice to you is stay tuned because it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. All right. Fourth story this week to continue with our pop music motif. Happy anniversary, baby. Got you on my mind. Only in this case, it's not that, that by the way, is you know, obviously a little rhythm band. But I'm not talking about that famous song because really this is more of a sad than a happy anniversary. This Thursday, June 22nd, will be the 40th anniversary of the disappearance of Umanuela Orlandi, a 15-year-old girl 
who was the daughter of a minor official in the prefecture of the papal household, whose family lived in an apartment inside the Vatican, and whose disappearance has gone on to become basically the Kennedy assassination of Italy. That is, the kind of mother of all magnet of conspiracy theories and speculation. Her brother, Pietro Orlandi, who has devoted his life to the search for the truth about his sister's disappearance, has called a gathering on June 25th, that is the Sunday after the anniversary. He's asked Italians of all stripes to gather in front of the Castel San Angelo in Rome to bring photos of Emanuela, and then to process down the Via della Conciliazione, that's the broad street that leads up to St. Peter's Square, to arrive in time for the Pope's noontime Angelus address, where Pietro has said he is expecting, indeed demanding, that Pope Francis will deliver some word of hope, some word of consolation about the disappearance of his sister. Now, all this comes amid a new, what, ferment in all of this. You know, in January, the Vatican's lead prosecutor, an Italian jurist by the name of Alessandro Didi, announced that the Vatican was opening its own investigation into the Irlandi case. The procurator of Rome, basically the DA of the city of Rome, has also opened an investigation the Italian parliament is currently considering whether or not to launch its own third investigation. Didi, the Vatican prosecutor, appeared before an Italian Senate committee in the past week where he came out against that, saying it would be a pernicious interference in the investigations that he and the procurator of Rome are carrying on. That brought blowback from Pietro Orlandi and the attorney of the Orlandi family, Laura Segro. We'll see where all this goes. But basically, my point is, it's really worth tuning in this coming Sunday, June 25th, to see what, if anything, Pope Francis says. This may not mean anything to you, but I promise you, in Italy, this is the biggest deal you can possibly imagine. And so what the Pope does or doesn't say, how the Vatican responds to this, it will have enormous repercussions. All right, finally, carry on my wayward son. As I teased at the top, that's a famous song by the band Kansas. Lead guitarist for that band, by the way, came from my hometown in western Kansas, old friend of mine. But in any event, this week, we're not talking about Carrie, C-A-R-R-Y, we're talking about John Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y, former Democratic presidential candidate in 2004, former U.S. Secretary of State during the Obama administration, and now during the Biden administration, the president's special envoy on the climate. He was in Rome on Monday to meet with Pope Francis. It was the third time Kerry met Pope Francis after meetings in 2016 and 2021. In this case, Kerry was here to talk with the Pope about the current state of environmental activism and, you know, politics around climate change. Kerry met with the press, including my own wife, Elise Ann Allen, who, you know, I'm just going to go out and say it, in my opinion, asked by far the most intelligent and penetrating questions that were posed to Kerry during this brief media avail that he did. Bottom line, Kerry said that it is possible that Pope Francis may attend COP28, which is the next meeting of the UN Summit on Climate Change scheduled for late November, early December in Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates. He also said that Pope Francis is you know, a leading figure in the global push for concern around the environment. He artfully dodged questions about Pope Francis's would-be role as a mediator in the Ukraine conflict, basically saying that I used to be the Secretary of State, but I'm not anymore, so I'm not going to talk about that. 
and also said that he thinks that the majority of American Catholics, I'd like to know what his polling is on this, but in any event, he said the majority of American Catholics agree with Pope Francis in terms of his environmental activism and his position on the climate change question. It is yet another indication, I think, basically speaking, that Pope Francis is highly congenial to what we might call the center-left constituency of the American church, that is, institutional Catholics who take the institutional church really seriously, who, who believe that the papacy and the Vatican and the Catholic Church generally are important, but nevertheless kind of have left-leaning political positions, such as Joe Biden, such as Nancy Pelosi, such as John Kerry, that this is their pope. And meanwhile, that for what you might call the center-right constituency in the American church, again, people who believe that the Vatican and the institutional apparatus of the church are really important, but who nevertheless have somewhat conservative political positions, you know, this pope isn't quite their guy. And look, you know, why, whatever you want to make of that, that is inevitable, right? I mean, ladies and gentlemen, let's face it, presidents, prime ministers, even popes, they come and go. What's eternal? What's eternal is our faith in Jesus Christ, redemption, salvation, the office of Peter. I think that's what matters, right? And the rest of this, while it is fascinating to handicap and follow, is, in a certain sense, ephemeral. All right, that is our show for this week. I want to remind you that we are continuing to try to generate support for Crux's managing editor, Charles, Charles Collins, who more than a month ago suffered a devastating illness. His wife, Claire, and their two boys desperately need your help. If you go on the Crux site, you will find an editor's note by me that contains a link to the GoFundMe campaign we have been running for Charlie and his family. Please, on bended knee, I beg you, if you can help, please do. You'll never find a better cause, I promise you. You will find full coverage of all the stories we've talked about on today's show on the Crux site, that is cruxnow.com. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, have a fantastic and blessed week. Know that you were in our thoughts and in our prayers. We will talk to you again very soon.